back for some lightning talks here. Um, I wanted to go ahead and give some more closing remarks just at the top of the top things off. I wanted to thank everyone again. This has been a fantastic um, conference so far. I'm really so pleased that so many people were able to present and to attend. And uh, with that said, we're going to start right into the lightning talks. Erica, you are first. And let me know when you're ready to go, and I'll start the timer. So you can start the timer now. Uh, let's talk about World Long Day 2022, OK? First of all, we are a global community. This event has 263 attendees, 38 different countries, around 10 time zones, could be more or less, we have no idea. And uh, also 20 languages. Of course, Paul Ruland speaks all of them. So it's easy. We had a work long day virtual uh, in 2021. I would like to thank every single one of you that were there. We had 56 videos, 50 speakers, 16 countries, 11 languages, 22 hours of YouTube, new YouTube content for Plone, and really interesting talks from all over the world, from all levels. I thank you all. And because it was good and the world is healing, ta-da, World Plone Day 2022, also a global event on April 27, 2022 from zero UTC to 11.59 p, uh, p.m. UTC. Okay, what's going to happen this year? Last year was everything online. Global is good, but local is even better. So we are going to have many local events. These are events confirmed for 2022. We are going to announce all the details of course, there are people saying, oh, but I want to have an event in here. Go to the World Plum Day webpage on plum.org and fill the form. These are nice people from Kit Concept, from uh, Simples Consultoria, from Odeweb, from Red Turtle, from uh, Clyson Partner, and our friends in Zurich, Peter, and uh, oh my God, I forgot your name now. You need to say it loud. Yeah, Katya, of course. And uh, please uh, remember one important thing. These local events are the way we talk with people that are close to us, that do not have access to the global community. They are important. These are how the event starts. These are how many of our community members start in the community. Also online, because we want to, to stream as much as possible of these local events. We want to have also smaller content videos that will go straight to YouTube and we're going to schedule them through, uh, through the day. The goal is to have 24 hour of streaming, at least 24 hour. It does not mean that it's going to be like one giant live thing because People will host events at the same time, so we could have two or three events happening at the same time. The idea is to showcase Plone. It's to talk about technology, talk about how Voto is and how to customize classic UI, share use cases. And by the way, I recommend you to stay for Lucas' presentation soon. That's one of the best use cases we have in Brazil. Interview, demos, talks about the community and how we can uh, uh, onboard new people. And it's multilingual. You do not need to host your event in English. You can do it in Esperanto. You can do it in Klingon. We don't care as long as you do it and you're happy in doing it. Okay, so last year we had Basque, we had Catalan, we had Brazilian Portuguese. I know, so strange, not many people speak that language. And please join us, plon.org events slash WPD. We can go also on Discord. There's an email. If you go right now to World Plone Day on the plone.org, there's a form. Fill the form. Send us your event. We are going to be very, very happy to have you with us next year and ideally in person. And of course, if you're going to a cool place like Maldivas, host an event there. 
we are going with you. Thank you all. See you soon. Excellent. I didn't even have to use the cowbell. Perfect. Wait, I can, uh, I can uh, quote some poetry, Vogon, until you have the cowbell. <laughs> oh, by the way, sponsorship here. And let's go, otherwise cowbell, and it's going to be depressing, right? Hey. All right. Let's see, here we go. We have the next one. We're admitting her now. We have Jania Hard with a quick talk on Collective Folk Calendar. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we're good. Ready to start? Uh, hopefully. <laughs> Tell me when and I'll start the timer. Here we go. Yeah, I guess I'm ready. <laughs> um, yeah, hi folks. Um, I uh, wanted to, to show uh, a little thing. Um, I was working um, the past months every now and then um, because um, we try to um, make um, uh, integration from uh, full calendar IO uh, into clone as a uh, product. Um, it's, it's only for the classic version at the moment. Um, so I guess I saw something in, uh, as a Volto package uh, flying uh, beside me, but um, this is a classic um, version. Um, and I just wanted to show a quick demo um, what is uh, there until now, um, up to now. Um, so we decided to um, be able to um, disable and uh, enable the full calendar on uh, the action um, as an action event um, on folders and collections. Um, and after you enabled it in, in this view, I have enabled it already. Um, you can have the full calendar settings to uh, make some settings for um, the, the hours and uh, the weekdays and uh, which uh, standard view you want to, to use. Uh, which hates the hides the calendar has um, and so on. Um, I'm sorry that this is in German, but this is a German German side. So um, yeah. Um, and then you can have um, the calendar view over the over the um, the, the view um, panel. Um, you can enable the full calendar view on the, the folder or the collection, um, switch between months, weeks, uh, and an overview. Um, this is uh, new since today because uh, in the develop branch, um, I will maybe merge it tomorrow in the master. Um, after I, I talk to uh, Katya, because she worked on this too and made a pull request. Um, you can select some uh, dates and get a form to add a new event. Um, I haven't tested it for, for several days, so this is a new one for me too. And it worked. Great. Um, yeah, um, you, if you click on it, you can, can uh, go to the, to the um, event itself, uh, work on it, uh, 
do a description, um, change the status or something else. And um, yeah, basically, basically that's what we implemented until now. Um, I definitely forgot one or two features, I guess, but um, you can find it on GitHub uh, in the collective. Um, and surely we are happy if you could test submit issues, maybe do pull requests or something like that. Um, if you have any need to work with the collective full calendar and um, yeah, I just wanted to, to show this shortly. So, you know, it's there and maybe some of you will have a use case for something like that. So yeah, I guess um, that's it. So yeah. Thank you, that was great. We didn't even have to use the car horn. And up next we have Michael McFadden. Whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay. Um, let's see what, what I do. I, I share my screen, right? That's what I do. I'm totally unprepared. I'm just coming out of one talk right into another talk. So my lightning talk is the many layers of Radio Free Asia. Um, if you didn't make it to my talk, it's okay. Radio Free Asia is a news site for Asian languages in country. Um, we're bringing the news into China that China does not want you to read. So um, we have um, 14 different languages. Here's an example of Tibetan. Here's an example of Cantonese. Here's an example of Uyghur. Um, no, that's not Uyghur, that's Tibetan. Here's an example of Uyghur. I don't even know my own languages. And the wonderful thing about um, standards is everybody wants their own. So once we put out a nice theme for the entire organization, we get somebody like this. I want to be different. Everybody wants to be different. I want a different thing over here. I want this displayed differently. Everybody wants something displayed differently because it's never good enough. So this is where I think browser layers come awesome. So the first thing um, we do, especially in Plone, is we create add-ons, add-ons for everything, because that's what browser layers are good part. So we have a theme for everybody. We have a theme for the Bengalis. We have a theme for the Cantonese. We have a theme for the uh, Koreans. We have a theme for the Mandarins and the Uyghurs and the Vietnamese. Everybody's got their own theme. And what we have is a standard theme. And since we're American and very biased about things, our standard theme is in English, of course. So the English theme is what we start with as our base theme. So here I'm going to quickly show you our code base. Um, you can actually see this on GitHub. Please, this is RFA site on Radio Free Asia RFA site. And if you're interested in it, just send me a uh, send me an email or drop me a, a line in Slack, and I'll give you access to it. Um, so ba our base theme, and if we go into our layout. Oh, no, what are we doing here? Profiles, browser layer, yay. We have our base theme, which is basically, let's turn our site into RFA. So all of our browser views are set up with that layer. And that's how we modify the basic, what classic clone is. That's how we modify it. But then when somebody else comes along and says, well, for example, everybody wants their own logo. So what happens is, is inside, I don't know, the Lao service. The Lao service has their first of um, their own profiles default browser layer. They have their own browser layer, RFA Lao. And then inside there, let's see if I can find my way through my code amazingly fast. And there's their, oh, okay. There's a good example. 
Lao has their own CSS. Everybody wants their own CSS. That's how we give Lao their own CSS. Um, and then their logo. Where do we put that? Okay, I can't find it, but we do have a browser view for a logo and it does actually have a layer on it. Um, so that's what I came to show you is that layers upon layers upon layers. And that's how we do things. And if we, if somebody wants something special, we just create a layer for them. And, and then they get all the special stuff they want. And that's it. I don't want a cowbell. Thank you. That was fantastic. And up next, we have Alexander. Hi. Um, right. Share the screen. Yeah. Does it work? Looks like. Yeah, we're good. Ready to start? Yes. All right. So sometimes we're not seeing the big picture if we're talking about specific uh, solution or specific portal uh, that we're presenting or use cases. The European regulation 2018, 17, 24 about the single digital gateway and the EU Europe project is a portal approach for citizen centric services in Euro the European Union. And it's quite interesting to see a scope from that and what it might have happened to with uh, together with Plon. So uh, what it is, uh, it's a regulation that has the goal to establish one single digital gateway to give access via the Euro European Europe portal to all citizens for information, information about procedures and a link to the procedure itself and assistance and problem solving services. And that must be accessible in all official language of the European Union. This is one of many of the multiple digitalization efforts in the European Union to make old style paperwork, uh, governmental work, more digitalized and centric for the, the uh, citizens. What it's all about is a single day, uh, digital gateway to find the services concerning you as a citizen, have it in a high quality um, uh, presented and give uh, procedures and a service for you and uh, collect feedback and statistics which services really work, what needs to be improved and everything about that. So the procedures. So if you request your birth certificate or if you move from one city to another, you just need to do the same procedure over and over again. And that's the thing, it should be standardized, should be available online to all uh, citizens, so the uh, European Union has um, said they want 21 procedures fully online through all the member states of the European Union and available for every citizen in the Union to do it with that. Those are those 21 procedures and as I'm coming from university for me studying and the uh, application uh, for admission in a higher education uh, environment is one centric and as every university has to do the same thing. It's a portal thing where you apply to it. If we're looking at uh, requesting proof of resident uh, re registration of birth proof of residence submitting income mm, tax declaration or register uh, in a change of address and everything. Those are services that are on the um, municipal level. So almost or several thousands of uh, small portals within the European Union do the same service all over again and again. So there's a long-term vision to centralize it and uh, integrate all your necessary electronic documents. But at the moment, 
you're just focusing on uh, the first step, bringing the things together with a citizen or customer centric design and focus, an editorial maintained directory of service and procedures, multilingual information and procedures, non discriminatory and accessible processes, the forms integrated into an authentication and authorization infrastructure. EIDAS is here one of the keywords, a strong IT security requirement and GDPR compliance. And as the European Union wants the citizen to have only one, so if you move, you don't need to tell 20 different institutions that you have moved and here's the new uh, verified address. It should be just selected, okay, inform that 10, 20 institutions directly on the update, or if you change your name or something like that. And the all for one implementation effort is, yes, we need the thing uh, that one may be implemented and several municipals can reuse this component, this special form. And it's all about that if all authorities needs uh, to offer all or partly of the same services, then we have a reuse of software components and design. And it's all about a common user interface and process flow. But what's the connection to Clone? Well, Clone is a very fantastic content integration framework and we can present all the content in different languages, present uh, information and forms to different of different backends within our systems. And Yesterday, uh, Pierre Nichols' talk, uh, Nicolis, uh, talk about EO Comune was just around about that. It's one of uh, those implementations and EMEO does the same. I think the EEA has also to submit or uh, give the information they provide into the portal. And what I wanna do is have an open space about that topic and what we as the Plone community might can do with our knowledge about component architecture and Plone and Volto to don't repeat ourselves over and over again, build integrated portal frontends for multiple backends and API and give an open source solution for that goal. Here are the links about it. Thank you. That was my small lightning talk. Thank you, Alex. That was fantastic. Up next, we have Martis with Image Transformation Chain. Although I don't see him in here yet. Maybe Kim, would you like to go next? Oh, I'm ready. All right, let's do it. I think I'm ready. Can you see me okay? Yep. All right. Uh, what I am going to talk about is uh, Plone in a Box, which, uh, as some of you may recall, last year it was a presentation I gave, and I was uh, interested in finding ways to make it easy for people to try Plone, not just on the demo site. As you know, we have demo.plone.org in the classic and in the Volto versions, but um, in case they wanted to try Plone, and uh, have their own content on it and maybe be able to show their colleagues or their, 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 you know, I'm thinking about nonprofits, for example, people just want to try something out, add some content, add some images, just see how it works for their uh, use case. And so Plone in a Box is the idea that I had, which was to just take our uh, unified installer at the time and put it onto a platform that is in the cloud. So that would be something like um, uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, um, as well as Linode. And the idea was that I'd also get it working on DigitalOcean. So last year I put together this um, repo, which is in the GitHub under, in the collective, it's called Plone in a Box. And you can go have a look at it and try it. It's, it's obviously uh, contributed for the community and it's looking for any help that you would like to give. But the idea again is to just make it easy to launch Plone on a server without any coding necessary. So really this is geared towards non-developers. I wanted um, it to be as easy as some clicking on a screen. Now, unfortunately, it's a little bit more complicated than that because um, 
um, and as, as I said last year, it was Plone 5.2. It's a little bit more complicated than that because you do have to create, um, say, an Amazon Web Services account. So I just wanted to show you the repo is over in here. There's all the instructions and the slides and the video linked. But uh, what you end up with is you go to, sorry, there's slides there. Uh, you go to Amazon Web Services and you can, if you follow the instructions, which I have in the repo, you basically create an account, uh, which unfortunately means that even though you may be qualified to use the free plan, you still have to put in a credit card because you know they want your money. Uh, money makes the world go round, right? So you go into the Amazon Web Services console, uh, you go to the EC2, the Elastic Cloud Compute, or Cloud Compute Cloud. Uh, you search for a community Amazon machine image, and then essentially with a few more clicks, then you get to launch a Plone, uh, Plone site on a server that got spun up for you with instance details and then the uh, IP address and so on. And after literally two and a half minutes, you have a Plone site running on a brand new server and you can mess with it to your heart's content. Um, so that is Plone in a box. Oops. Um, it is on Amazon Web Services. It is on Linode. I didn't quite get it to the point where it was working on DigitalOcean. However, uh, what I want to do this weekend is sprint on it. And the first thing I want to do is make it use the new Docker images that Plone 6 has. So um, that I had really enjoyed Erico's talk on Plone deployment. So that's what we're going to try to use um, and try to make it work on DigitalOcean, uh, which has, I think, a much nicer docker story now so please join me this weekend um, you can contact me in about 25,000 different ways and um, i look forward to your feedback suggestions and your help thanks kim that's amazing i didn't even have to buzz you out very nice job let's move on to the next one Mortis, when you're ready Hi, Lucas. Hello, well, Lucas. Can we have uh, Mortis run next and then you? Yeah. Yeah? Perfect. Yes. I'm just sharing my screen. And okay. Yeah, looks good. You ready? Yes. Here we go. Hey, everybody. I'm Lucas. I'm presentation planning in the Brazilian Superior Electoral Court. Uh, about me, uh, I'm Brazilian. I'm developing. Uh, at Sonda, working with Plonin for 10 years, implements portals and the internet solution. Also actively in, in the Brazilian Python community. Uh, and also a member of uh, Plonin.br initiative. And I'm talking about the portal of the just, electoral justice and what we use on the portal. Uh, front change is basically back from change in Ginex, Vanish, Agaprox, uh, and back end I use the last release of Plan 4, okay, and archetypes and Diazo. And the evolution of project is starts uh, in Plan 3. In 2010 and 2012, we migrate to 24. Uh, in 2021, we start off migration to Plone 5. Uh, and finish, I expect, 
uh, the new version 0.5 in 2022. Is the face of the, the portal is the same face or the all states of Brazil in 27 uh, states in the regional in the states is a regional elector curve. Uh, what key, what can you find on the portal? Uh, the portal presents an uh, electoral situation to the citizens, election news, and electoral legislation about the consulting for every users. Uh, our team, the team is in, in election day on G where uh, the Elizabeth is an infrastructure and other people is developer. And you see the Fernando Bezerra, uh, André Climaco, Kazu Aoki, and I. Uh, we have a plan initiative to support and training other uh, users to development, uh, development and plan in electoral justice. Uh, in this photo is giving training of development infrastructure in TEMI. Uh, in this training of uh, is on uh, is at the Minas Gerais Belo Horizonte. We training about 20, 20, 20 people, 20 users on Pony framework. Uh, and is it the access to the main site use www.tsc.br international site english tsc.br uh, you know that is it thank you that was fantastic okay thank you and up next we Finally, have I cannot share my screen or other participant <laughs> screening. I think, uh, let me see if I can get him to stop. Uh, it's finished. Hey, Lucas, will you turn off sharing, screen sharing? I don't know if I can do it. I'll put you in the waiting room for now. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah. 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 No, hey, there we go. <laughs> Tell me when you're ready. Sure. Yeah. Do you see my slides now with some tasty looking cakes? Everyone looks far. good. Yeah. Okay, so this is part of my presentation from this afternoon about focal points. So just briefly share, okay, uh, without any focal points for cropping your images, it looks like the above and otherwise uh, with focal points uh, below or even a better example, yeah, very vague pictures above and they become uh, these pictures below. Uh, to do that, uh, you can read some about that, some code in experimental.focal points on my own GitHub account. Um, the problem there was that I needed to uh, change lots of things uh, in clone name file and clone.scale. And I thought, hey, can that be better perhaps? And so I have an idea to do that differently uh, with an image transform chain. Uh, we already have the clone transform chain 
uh, which transforms HTML. So if you're using Diazzo with blown up theming, then you're uh, using this and Plone Protect does uh, some auto protection. Plona Blocks uses it for tiles. And yeah, there are lots of other transforms in Plone actually, but yeah, we can add another transform for images. Uh, we could add a transform, a transform chain uh, for transforming the original image or use a similar chain when transforming a scale of an image. And I think we might uh, add something like that in Plone 6.1 as a clip, but we'll have to see uh, about that. So what could you do if we create such a transform chain? For the original, you can say something like, hey, the user has uploaded a file of 25 megabytes. I don't like that. Uh, we scale it down to 10 megabytes or 25 kilobytes just to uh, spite the user. Or the user uploads a TIFF image, we can create a JPEG from that, which is actually what Plone scale itself does during scaling. Uh, or we can say, hey, uh, change to original, um, create it a simpler mode. If it's, it can be grayscale, and then it also gets smaller, the image, which that's also, again, something that Plone scale does after scaling, but we can use something like that on the original as well. For my presentation uh, earlier, you can add uh, one or more focal point detectors in here and get an XY coordinate uh, from them. Uh, maybe this is a good place to delete old scales if they are no longer useful. So that's one way to do uh, things. You can also transform uh, when you create a scale, we can do that with a transform chain. Uh, well, several of the above items, uh, we could uh, do that. Uh, Plone name file already saves some EXIF information. If data about the photo when it was taken, uh, that could be done in a uh, move to a transform, uh, maybe image quality. You get that in here, change the image or add source set information. Uh, the actual scaling or cropping of the uh, transform uh, that of the scale that could also happen in the chain. So yeah, these would all be all kinds of adapters. And yeah, you can uh, change uh, those adapters. Uh, that could, yeah, a basic image transformer could look, some class could look like this. Uh, you have an order 5,000. If you want your transformer to run earlier, okay, you give it an order of uh, 1,000 or well, 42, which is really early. It's available by default. Uh, you get the context, or maybe we'll uh, just pass the field value in there, the named blob file, named blob image. Uh, we will call a prepare method and that will try a few things, see if, hey, is this, uh, do we really want to call this transform in this, in this particular use case? Hey, are we actually doing any cropping on an image or are we using an original image? New things like that. And after a while, uh, afterwards, yeah, you run, uh, you have a runner, uh, which does the actual transforming. And then you would yeah, call all trend the uh, Transform chain would call all transformers. Uh, it gets adapters, maybe named adapters. Uh, it puts them in the right order and checks if they want to be run for this particular image or for this uh, scale direction, and then you run it. So I think that could be a viable option to yeah just make all the the images more pluggable. And we have now plo named file and plo scale which pass the, the image back to each other and if we can do that better. So uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you for another excellent talk. And uh, Calvin, whenever you're ready. I am ready. Let me share my screen. Awesome. All right, folks. Why should you listen to me now? Why do you care about any of this? I'm going to tell you right now that PyM rocks and doing anything otherwise is dangerous. Using any other Python on your system is dangerous and you should not do it. Let's talk about why. First of all, we all want to be Zen. We're all Pythonistas. We all know the Zen of Python. These three tenets are super important to staying Zen and to using the correct Pythons on your systems. There are some rules. We don't want to use sudo. I don't care no whining. Do not use the Python system Python for 
anything, no matter what. It's not yours. It's not there for you. It's there for the system. Okay, smart guy, what am I going to use? Well, of course, Pyam. That's why I'm here to talk to you about. Oh, let me give it a notification here. We want to be able to have a global Python version on a per user basis and change it at will. We want to have per project Python versions. We want to override the Python versions with environment variables. We want to be able to search for commands across multiple versions of Python at the same time. And it's easy to install. Uh, we can install it from the GitHub. Probably the easiest way if you are on, uh, on Mac or Linux is to use Homebrew. If you're on Windows, you're going to have to check out PyMWin because that's the only way you can do it. Let's give a quick little demo here. If we are wanting to install PyEnv, we'll do brew install PyEnv. That'll give you all the, the details and needs and get all the stuff installed in the right place. I've already got it installed, so we're good to go. So what is PyEnv doing for me? It is managing my versions of Python for me. If I want to know what global versions of Python that Py PyEnv has installed, I can just type PyEnv global. It shows me I'm using 396. If I want to see all the versions that are available, I can type versions and it shows me all the versions that I've added into the system. If I want to install another version, say I wanted 3.9.5 because I don't have it, I would do that. I'm not going to do it right now because it'll take a hot moment, but that would be how you'd add another version of Python to your system. This may be great and all. Uh, you can see if we are, I'm actually, let's go to my desktop because that's where I'll do the demo from. Uh, let's go back over here. Okay, so if I want to use a different version of Python than the global, because remember I said PyM global was three or was three nine seven. If I want a local version of Python here that's different than three nine seven, I can just type PyM uh, local and type three dot nine dot six because I know three nine six is there. And bam, you'll see my prompt is showing me Python three nine six right there. If I type Python without having to do any kind of virtual environment uh, it, enabling, I'm on three nine six. If I go back up a directory, I'm on 397. If I type Python, 397. So I've got easy maintenance and access to all the various versions of Python that are available to me. Now, more importantly than that, I want to be able to have sandboxes and virtual environments that are specific to my various projects. Let's talk about the PyM plugins. If you just search through for PyM, you'll find a couple plugins. These are the two I recommend you installing right away. VirtualEnv and VirtualEnv Wrapper. <clears throat> Let's check those out and see how they work. Uh, if we go back into our desktop folder, we'll see we're in Python 3.9.6. I'm going to make a Project 1 folder, and I'm going to want to use a different version of Python. I want to use Python 3.8 for Project 1. Let's see what versions of 3.8 I have installed. 3.8.6. So let's use 3.8.6. We'll create a Project 1 environment. I am virtual env, and we will create a 3.8.6 one called proj1. And then the magic goes, kind of what you normally expect. Now, our virtual environment is not attached to this directory yet. We still need to do pyenv local proj1. And now the real magic happens. You can see I'm using 3.8.6, and I'm using the virtual environment project1. <clears throat> and say so I want to now pip install requests. Because everyone uses requests, but everyone might need different versions of requests. If I do pip freeze now, I should only see requests and its direct uh, dependencies installed, which I do. 2.26.0. Let's go up a directory and make it, we're going to make another directory called project2. 2, whoops. Alright, well we're going to roll with it. Two, uh, two J's are better than one, obviously. And we're going to do the same thing. pyenv virtual env. We're going to use 3.9.6 this time for this specific environment, calling it proj2. Now in this project, I want a different version of request than I had on my previous uh, version. We still got to make sure we attach this one, so we'll call local proj proj2. Bang, Project2 is now our ready to go virtual environment. Now we're going to install requests that is less than 2.26 because I don't want the latest version. Maybe there's a bug in it. Maybe they changed some dependency that conflicts with my current project. And now if we do pip freeze, we've got instead of uh, the new version using a different uh, character detection, we've got 
chart A 4.0.0. If I go into project one now and do the same command, you'll see there's using charset normalizer 2.0.7. So different dependencies, different projects. What's the big benefit here? I did not have to activate, deactivate, deal with it, whatever it is. That is what I want to show you all today. Check out those plugins. PyEnv is awesome. Oh, Six Feet Up is also hiring right now for a Plone developer. So come work with our awesome team, and I'll see you all here in PloneConf. Thank you, Calvin. That was fantastic. Next up, we have Paul. Paul, we can't hear you yet. Hmm. Oh, there we go. I hear you, but we don't see you. There we go. I don't think we can hear you, though. Okay, I'll kick you out. And try again. Okay, I can see you. I don't see audio though. Do you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Ah, great. Okay. Uh, yay. All right. Are you ready to go? <laughs> yes, I hope okay. so. All right. Uh, some of you guys might remember, I, so for, for my person, I'm a developer at the University of Dresden in Germany. Um, maybe some of you know our site. It's heavily customized, and we have many uh, little change templates uh, compared to the original one, and eventually we have to keep track of all the customizations. So about a month ago, we or I wrote a topic uh, at the community board and was wondering about what what you do for tracking the changes. So there was a really meaningful uh, input there, and what we come up with is. Uh, little nifty tool, which does not only check for your changes, but it also applies uh, changes which comes from, from remote. So if, if you update your plan site, uh, so some add-ons, those changes will go into your own customizations. 
So I have this little example here, this plant uh, five site. I have just made a little tiny change to uh, make an ensemble. So this is there's this little icon there. So it's not, not nothing big. And let's see how we can use our tool with this customization. So one word about this tool, it's called Collective Patch Watcher. It's not released yet, but this is the readme. The setup is pretty easy. You just add this part here, just copy and paste it, and then you can run it. Uh, just one look into the source. Uh, I have this all rights folder, and there I have the it's a template which is responsible for rendering, rendering the status message. And there I have this little icon here. And so, how does this tool actually work? Uh, by convention, it demands uh, for every add on you have to create this overrides uh, underscore info py. And you have uh, you have to stage which declarations, uh, which uh, overrides you have. So the usage is pretty simple. You just say, okay, I have this uh, package. I have some file overwritten. It's written against this version. Uh, there's a local path in this package. And this is a path of my uh, customized uh, file, which is in this case is an override. Uh, yeah, it's just all written with JBot. So how to use it? So it's pretty simple. Just write patch watcher. Then you state uh, for which uh, add-on you will check against. Uh, in this case, it's TOD add-ons multilingual. And when I press enter, I get this pretty robust output. But what it does actually say it's it checks against the current current storage uh, version, which is 3.4 for clone app layout, and the patches written against 3.0. And it, what it tries to do is first it checks if there are changes, and then it tries even to uh, merge those changes. Does it in the same way as Gitlet does, which is the three way merge? And for now, it's only uh, just a test run. And it also says uh, if you want to write these changes, you can use dash uh, w, which I'm going to do. And yeah, that's it. No complex detected. And let's have a look into the source. And now we see this line, which is some bug fix, I guess. So the domain is here declared. Now, this is just, uh, say, the petty part. What happens if I have uh, changed something in the line which is going to be updated from uh, some other part? I don't know. So let's say I have my own uh, domain here. And I want to write those changes as well. Janet says, complex detected. Please fix them on, the, on your own. And, and if you have a good uh, IDE, you will give this nice, or somewhat nice <laughs> input. At least you can say, OK, I accept my changes or the incoming changes. And yeah, it makes work much easier if you have not just one uh, customized file, but just say 80 or more like we have on our site. So this can be a huge time saver. And yeah, the add-on is not uh, published yet, but it will be. There are also some other neat stuff like if you do not declare a package, it will automatically check all of your uh, packages, uh, development packages. Um, it also checks so if, if 
the hour rates info is not there. It also says that. So it's very verbose, but uh, it's intended to be very friendly for the developer. So yeah, maybe you can try it out. I'm going, trying to release it by the end of the week or just the sort of weekend. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, that was great. And this concludes our lightning talks for today. And this is uh, the end of our conference program as well. Thank you, everybody.